start a boot camp, FinTech and Cybersecurity in Amsterdam, and it's the fourth in our Let's Talk series, podcast series. My name is Elizabeth Feinfeld. I'm responsible for the partners, and today we're going to talk about compliance. So let me introduce our experts. To my right is Patrick Ryan, the founder of KYCNet, former MD of Equinity in KYC Solutions, and angel investor in FinTech. And on my left, Gideon Drury, the CEO and founder of FinCom.co. So Patrick, tell us a little bit about your experience from going from a founding, uh, founding a startup that works with large corporates to being taken over um, by Equinity. Yeah, well, that, that, that is some journey. Uh, I started KYCNet about eight years ago in uh, 2008, nine years now. Uh, the idea was to make KYC, Know Your Customer, onboarding um, faster, smarter, and cheaper. Um, we were focusing very much on legal entities. KYC, onboarding, um, compliance, due diligence, especially mm -hmm. from an anti-money laundering point of view, from a counter-terrorist finance point of view, is largely focused on either natural persons mm -hmm. or legal entities. Natural persons, myself, I have a current account. Um, I go into a bank, I want to open another account. Mm -hmm. Here I am, here's my passport. They check my name against lists and so on. Relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. My colleague here can talk about some of the intricacies in a few minutes, I'm sure. Um, when it comes to legal entities, it's actually far more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, who is this legal entity? Who owns the legal entity? Who are the directors? Ah, the owner is another legal entity in a different mm -hmm. country. Who owns that legal entity? Two more legal entities. Well, till eventually you find a so-called ultimate beneficial owner. Mm -hmm. So not only are you dealing with legal entities as opposed to natural persons, those legal entities also have natural persons. Right. So it makes it quite complex. In 2008, it was a very, very difficult thing for banks to deal with, predominantly banks. Um, the world of KYC is overseen by a number of regulators, uh, European regulators that fall under the third and fourth EU directives, mm -hmm. US regulators that fall largely under the uh, USA Patriot Act. Um, in 2008, they were getting serious. In 2014, 15, 16, they got very serious. Time has moved on, new regulations have come in, the regulations have tightened, the scope of the number of industries that fall under this anti-money laundering, mm -hmm. counter-terrorist finance regime has broadened. The best practices have increased. The competition between players that need to onboard with respect to regulators and regulators' expectations have changed. So now I'm going to ask you, how are you helping large corporates deal with all of that? Because a startup to get into a large corporate, mm -hmm. that's quite a difficult process. Very, very difficult. Um, when we started, we realized quite quickly that as a small privately owned company, um, many, many of our target clients were not set up to actually onboard us as mm -hmm. clients right. to help them onboard their clients. Um, we had to work very, very closely with a great number of, um, of larger banks here in Europe uh, for a long time before the message that we had that outsourcing KYC was firstly legal, mm -hmm. secondly made sense, thirdly could be done well okay. and cost effectively. It took a long time for that to happen. But then we had, we were very fortunate, we had a number of very, very early uh, early adopters of mm -hmm. the service mm -hmm. and then they helped us by giving us feedback, continuous feedback on building the platform that we built. The idea was all of our clients have, have and will have uh, multiple ever-changing requirements. They all have an understanding of what their regulatory uh, responsibilities are mm -hmm. and they're often different because their regulatory responsibilities are to have a risk-based approach. Mm -hmm. That risk-based approach needs to be within the context of their specific business. And each bank has a slightly different business, um, slightly different focus area, different geo, different types of customers, different mm -hmm. types of products. So a different kind of risk appetite. So working together with lots and lots of banks, we got to understand their risk appetite. Mm -hmm. We got to understand their risk policies. And we were able to build a platform 
that allowed us to show our clients that we were performing the work they needed to do mm -hmm. quickly, completely, cost effectively. So now I'm going to ask you, Gideon Solution, dealing with natural persons. Yep. Um, how would that fit into what you guys are doing? I just want to point out something about what Patrick was mm -hmm. talking about. In 2008, it was only about banks. Yep. So it was a hard sale. Mm -hmm. Banks are the hardest sale. Mm -hmm. Now, since especially the fourth EU directive and, the, and also the EU Justice Department directives on this, the scope has broadened, as Patrick pointed out. We're talking about e-commerce companies. Mm -hmm. We're talking mm -hmm. about gaming and gambling on the net. Absolutely. So we're looking at uh, insurance companies, brokers, and so on. All of these companies need to act within the same re regulations as banks. One of the ways now to enter the market is don't go to the bank. Mm -hmm. Go to the, all the other players. Their, their policies of onboarding a service provider are far easier and you could start setting up your track record by selling to a four billion uh, pound company that's publicly traded. And then a smaller bank will say, wait a second, if they took you, that must be okay. Let's start working with you too. So Same. let's backtrack and have you tell what your solution does. Well, we use um, artificial intelligence, we use advanced mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, that includes fuzzy logic, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of these great buzzwords, but we actually use it in a phonetic processing of names um, and databasing, uh, databases. So we understand different entries mm -hmm. throughout 23 different languages and spelling mistakes and so on, how to find them. So the problem is that you have all these international lists, if we look at anti-money laundering. Mm -hmm. around 300,000 names at any given point of time. But the amount of variations on those names, first, middle name, last name, and you switch them around, and the intentional or mm -hmm. simple human error spelling mistakes. You're coming out, Price Waterhouse kind of pointed out, it'll be around 20 somewhat billion variations of those 300,000 names. So mm -hmm. let me ask you, if normally they're just touching the 300,000, now through your technology, they're able to find a lot more people who would have fallen out. No, that's not, that's not no? what's happening. What's what we're enabling to do is they have to actually look at all the variations. So they don't have to search the 20 billion, and there's no mm -hmm. human possibility to do that. What we're enabling to do in a second is do the 20 billion variations. So we're, we're doing exactly mm -hmm. what Patrick was talking about, is reducing the burden considerably mm -hmm. by automation, using that, um, those advanced algorithms that we developed. It took us seven years to develop it, mm -hmm. um, and the understanding of the mathematics, and to implement it in an area of uh, what's called regulation technology, RegTech, specifically in the compliance. Mm -hmm. So when somebody has to do onboarding, and he has to search natural persons, Mm -hmm. uh, against certain lists, we do it faster and better than any technology out there right now. So let's look at online onboarding. Yep. There are so many facets that are included in that. So you have one, you have to identify somebody with a government issued ID. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you have to authenticate, is that person who you identified the same person that is wanting to uh, be onboarded uh, to go through, uh, let's say, border control, all those types of things. And that you can do by biometrics, but other things yep. as well. And you need to check them against these databases. Those are only three, and there's, I'm sure, a lot more that goes into it, getting the right other type of paperwork altogether. So if um, a, a large corporate wants to have a solution for all of these things, the bundling of these solutions really helps on the uptake because it's like a one-stop shop. Absolutely, and that was very much our idea back in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, the idea was we will receive the customer requests to be onboarded, we will receive all of the information that the customer is providing, and we'll do the checking. Mm -hmm. Now in 2008 and today, a huge amount of it is still manual because you're dealing with unstructured information, you're dealing with uh, multiple extracts from multiple companies' houses across the world in multiple languages, mm -hmm. you're dealing with uh, ownership information, 
ownership information is usually not available in a structured format. It might be buried on page 47 of an annual report that's written in Turkish or Arabic or Russian or Chinese mm -hmm. or Hebrew or Greek or whatever the case may be. Difficult to find in many, many cases. So there's a huge amount of manual document mm -hmm. gathering, manual document analysis. Now, anything that we can do from 2008 until now to bring in optical character recognition, to bring in smartphone-based onboarding where you can capture uh, a facial image mm -hmm. and you can bounce it against, for instance, a digital image that might be present in a passport. Mm -hmm. um, anything we can do to minimize, and this is where my colleague comes in, where Gideon comes in with his solution, false positives and false negatives in mm -hmm. screening. The process, uh, one of the things that you need to do from an onboarding point of view is to screen. Mm -hmm. Screen legal entities, screen natural persons against international sanctions lists. Okay. You need to screen them against politically exposed persons exactly. lists. And in many cases, you also need to do bad press screening. Mm -hmm. you Typically, also to, You also want to screen them in into your internal databases. You want yes. to see that like there's an international bank, he, you, don't, you don't want to give somebody credit here, he suddenly goes to a different country and so opens up a different yep. bank account. That's true. And gets another. So yep. that's exactly the difference on onboarding that you need to do. Yeah, yeah. and by, by onboarding people properly, you, with the proper legal identifiers for the natural persons and the legal entities, you can do that net analysis, network mm -hmm. analysis and network diagnostics within your own databases clients can within their mm -hmm. databases to track that oh Patrick Ryan has just opened another account in Germany and right. it's the same Patrick Ryan that has an account in Holland and so on. Um, getting back to the screening process name identification. In many cases uh, for instance Russian acrylic names, Arabic names, Chinese names, Hebrew names, names that are written in a non-western character set mm -hmm. they can have multiple versions in the Latin Western mm. character set. Yeah. So it's very difficult to track and see. First name, middle name, last name. Spanish have four names, four, you know, yeah. Yeah, that's four true to too. five names, and yeah. then they play around. Absolutely. So what you'll find is people will attempt to be onboarded mm -hmm. as a client uh, or as a director of a legal entity. And the difficulty is when you do the screening, it throws up lots of hits. Mm -hmm. Now, typically those hits are analyzed by individuals, by people. Anything you can do to maximize the accuracy of the hits, minimize the number of false positives, mm -hmm. will speed up the process and reduce the cost of the process. By speeding yeah. up the process, reducing the cost, um, the industries that are fall within the regimes will actually create a little bit more buffer, a little bit more um, um, a financial um, um, ability to do better, to do a better job, to reinvest that. So now I'm going to ask you, you talk about helping with these false positives. Well, we had, when Patrick and I met, I think it was three weeks ago, we started to have this interesting conversation. What's more important, false mm -hmm. positive or false negative? Right. And Patrick was saying on the bank side, false positives, because they're getting well, 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 I think it's fair to say the cost side. Cost side. No, you're, you're false looking, positive. You were looking at the immediate. They on, were looking at the, the security and fraud false detection, false terrorist detection. Yeah. False negative. Yeah. So Patrick is saying on the immediate cost, they're all looking at the false positives because if they get a hundred false positives, that means around two hundred to three hundred man hours just to go through that, and sometimes even more because it's a manual process. But the, the false impact. but the false negative, yeah. mm -hmm. here's, a, here's, a, here's a piece of information. From 2009 mm -hmm. to 2015, EU banks have paid 50 billion euro in fines. This is incredible. So this yeah. is by the is EU really Commission. Big. This is exactly yeah. what Patrick yeah. was pointing out. Absolutely. From 2008, they started to rank up the kind of the fines, mm -hmm. and they're becoming even bigger and bigger and more... Uh, but now they're kind of giving this buffer time for everybody yeah. to get ready for EU fourth directive and the new US regulations that came out in 2017 January so I'm gonna I think we're gonna see a surge again during 2018 to 2020 and by the way it's expected by the entire industry mm -hmm. yeah, uh, of more fines and they also added now personal liability by the way including jail time yes. so yes. The, the head of compliance yeah. of MoneyGram yep. is doing a year in federal prison right now. So, 
they're increasing the burden of proof yep. and increasing the impact if you are not doing what they think it, you need to be doing. The regulatory requirements don't change that often or that mm -hmm. quickly, but the regulatory expectations that okay. you're performing according to the level that is required is, changing. Uh, is tightening. Yeah. Now, it often comes in fits and starts. You know, mm -hmm. you mentioned the massive fines. A number of those massive fines have come down to process failures mm -hmm. uh, rather than technology failures. They've come down to some would argue that the the you know New York State regulators have discovered a new revenue stream to pay for huh. to pay for right. roads and infrastructure. I've heard that before. So yes. they've you know they've they've levied multi-billion right. dollar fines against European banks. Um, so it's fits but and that's starts. Federal, by the way. It's Sorry, not, it's not New York. It's federal. Uh, but that's but that's fine. You know the you, the new revenue stream of the EU, the new revenue stream of the U.S. Depart uh, uh, Justice yeah. Department, DOJ. Uh, DOJ uh, it's all true to a certain extent. Or on the other side, HSBC was caught doing money laundering of, uh, I think it did eight billion, and it was fined, oh, excuse me, it was fined eight billion. But it came to Congress and they said, wait a second, they made $20 billion, mm -hmm. what did we do? Yeah. And then they added the personal liability because if they could just do this and walk away with a profit of 12, then they mm -hmm. didn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. All right, so GDPR is a new regulation coming in. Yeah, big one. Next year. Tell May us how. May 2018. Right. Please tell us a little bit about how FinCom can help with GDPR. Well, GDPR is interesting because everybody, GDPR has five sections to it. And the first four sections are everything about protection of data and how the data is supposed mm -hmm. to be protected and the different steps that companies and organizations need to take on protecting the data. So everybody's really focused on that. But the fifth section is the more costly section. The fifth section is everything about privacy. And the right to be forgotten or not? And so that's, which is known mm -hmm. as the right to be forgotten. So mm -hmm. the fifth section is split into two. That needs to be explained. Just give me 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. The first section of that says, once a year I need to send Patrick a report as a company. What information I have about Patrick? I have his phone number, email, mm -hmm. height, whatever. Whatever I gathered about him, once a year I have to send him that report. The, the second part of it says, if Patrick ceases to, become, uh, ceases to be a client of mine, mm -hmm. or Patrick notifies me, I have to delete all information about him. And how many of these companies really know where all that information Nobody is? Nobody knows where all the information is. So everybody has databases yep. and have multiple databases and have different sorts of databases and legacy and different IT. Nobody talks to each other. Even the legacy systems of Oracle have a problem to be compatible. Mm -hmm. So Oracle understood this and said, okay, I'll add a phonetic system within my system called SoundX, using an algorithm. Mm -hmm. But that only works on English to English and that's a 125 year old algorithm. Good, but not really doing the job. That's the biggest problem. So again, Pricewaterhouse, ENY, McKenzie, all are saying to give you a single report is going to cost a company between one hour to 10 hours of man hours. So we're talking about 50 euro man hour here in the Netherlands. That's for a company that's consumer facing and has 1 million customers, clients, that's 50 million euro a year. That's a huge amount. And I even thought 50 euros uh, for one man hour was actually on the low side, but okay. I would, and add, I would agree on the low side in Holland. Uh, so if you blended rates between offshore, on-site, and so on and so forth. Incredibly costly, and I, I agree. What I've seen over the past uh, six, seven, eight years is as client onboarding was looked at, mm -hmm. uh, the discovery that a great number of banks that we've spoken to was they might have seven or eight or nine or 12 master data sets. Mm -hmm. Um, the amount of inaccuracies that have crept into oh, that absolutely. over the years. So from a GDPR point of view, finding the right information already it's is already. incredibly difficult. So that's where uh, you know, Gideon Solutions can greatly help. So what we're offering is, if I may, is, um, is a simple solution, extremely using sophisticated technology, but it's immediate. And it will give you a mapping of your database mm -hmm. per individual. Mm -hmm. So if I'll, again, put in Patrick, it will actually show me where Patrick is throughout the entire database. Mm -hmm. So I'll map out 
even the parallel mistakes, parallel universes of Patrick was in my mm -hmm. database, and it'll give it to me on one piece of paper, and at the same time will also show me what the information, will find the information mm -hmm. that I've gathered about Patrick by looking at exactly the columns that are filled about Patrick. I don't need to show the telephone number I have, I just need to say I have a telephone. Mm -hmm. So that will be on a one page, maybe sometimes two page report, yeah. straight out, simple, timestamp. So if there's a need then to delete, we're talking about a process that will take exactly two seconds at most. And if you need to delete, you take this map, a junior DBA, database. Mm -hmm. uh, data protection uh, officer. Data protection officer. Mm -hmm. Uh, can actually take five minutes and erase, delete everything because yeah, he that's knows where incredible. it is. And we're taking that's from huge 50 savings. million euro to less than 500,000. Yeah. And that's one aspect of GDPR. Right. As you mentioned, five areas, the first four to do with protection, uh, to make sure that there's no leaks, there's no hacks, you don't lose information, you don't share information that's not permissioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, the fifth area is the right to be forgotten, the right to delete. Yep. However, the kink there is um, there's lots of exceptions. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if we're looking at re regulatory issues, if we're looking at things like uh, customer onboarding, due mm -hmm. diligence and so on, um, often uh, when I was with Aquinity, we referred to the software that we had as not a client lifecycle system, but a compliant client lifecycle system. Okay. It was focused very much on meeting the regulatory requirements. Now, if somebody has been onboarded and gone through a money laundering, counter-terrorist finance set of checks and processes and so on, so on and so forth, and if they want to be deleted. forgotten, deleted, they can't. Because you need to keep that information. That's so exactly in why the you GDPR, have a map. It's extremely important. What mm. can you delete? What can't you delete? You need and how do you make sure that you're keeping the right information? What you keep, you need a sandbox. Yes. That's yep. exactly Patrick's pointing out. Mm perfect point. You need to understand where that database is. That's why we're giving you an actual, actual map. Then you see, oh, this is something that I need to keep. Yep. You just sandbox it. You don't delete it. Yep. But then you know that you sandboxed it in a certain place, in a certain point. And, and to what extent do you think that politically exposed persons, for example, will ask to be deleted? I mean, how does that uh, come into play? Uh, well, in theory, in theory, anybody that was associated with an onboarding that went through due diligence mm -hmm. from a money laundering or counter-terrorist point of view um, needs to be kept for a period of time. It has to be determined, and I've yet to see what the recommended period of time is, mm -hmm. but the GDPR is clear. There's like, correct me if I'm wrong, five or six different criteria um, where you are encouraged to not delete and uh, two or three of those are to do a record keeping for court, for uh, mm -hmm. regulatory purposes, for legal purposes in the future. I think the GDPR says it doesn't countermine any actual laws that are out there. So let's say if you did any transaction, you have to keep that on a tax issue for seven years so the tax mm -hmm. can come back. You won't be able to delete mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. but they'll have to take all the receipts that they gave that customer and keep it in a sandbox. So, it's not, it's, it's still doing the reporting, still taking and mm -hmm. splitting the information, finding that information and processing that information, yep. and just keeping it, instead of deleting it right now, it even adds another burden and saying, put it here, it's, save it, it in it, a box. It's a, it's a burden, but at the same time, big corporations, financial institutions and others have been struggling for years with their data. Yeah. And it's yeah. always been a, a business opportunity sure. struggle. It's always been, if we had one picture of our customer, we could sell more. We could cross sell, right. we could upsell, and so on and so forth. And people have struggled for years. But now there's a regulatory need to do that. Mm -hmm. So actually, you know, the regulator's coming in. The regulator is going to uh, ensure that massive amount of resources are going to be spent tidying up databases. So. so Actually, it's a positive. It's an initial positive because, of course, the uh, data privacy, data protection, right to be forgotten um, ideas behind GDPR make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But secondly, it also will force companies to get to the end state that they've been struggling with for years um, to have um, manageable databases on all their natural persons and legal right. entities. So now I'm going to talk about manageable databases and then I think we need to wrap up. Um, Manageable databases, you see a lot of M&A activities and how 
there are duplicates within those uh, um, mergers, let's say, and that your solution helps to not only show where the duplicates are, but clean that up, right? So our solution is database matching. So we took our solution, really, and we pushed it towards the regulation technology area of compliance. So mm -hmm. be it anti-money laundering, anti-terrorist funding, or GDPR, we are focused on that. I can tell you right now that we've already, uh, our, our technology has been um, licensed to upgrade um, border control search. Fantastic. So that's a deal where it's being implemented in 20 different countries. Um, Exciting. That's uh, one of our first uh, actual implementations on what's called Homeland Security. Database matching of entries is a huge problem and mm -hmm. one of the big problems of uh, mm -hmm. big data. Patrick has touched about, uh, talked about the problems of banks um, and knowing exactly who their customers are and so on. When you know, when you can clean your database and have a clearer picture or see the mm -hmm. forest beyond the trees, um, then you can really access and, and know what you have there. And you can comply. Not only comply, you could also increase your sale, increase mm -hmm. your positioning, mm -hmm. uh, offer different things, reduce costs. One of the biggest issues, mm -hmm. look, Bitcoin right now is in a huge surge because it doesn't do any of this. It doesn't take upon itself any of the verifications and compliance and problem. And I, I presume one of the biggest issues we're going to have about Bitcoin soon enough is that it's not compliant to anything. And the regular will come and regulator will come in and say, hey, you, 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 give me money. You're mm -hmm. non-compliant. You're yep. doing stuff. And that's a mm -hmm. huge problem. And that's a totally different area, right? So it's virtual money transaction and brokerage, and they need to use technology, they need to use companies like KYC Net or Acuity Now, and, and our technology to meet their need, to meet those compliance, they just can't. What you see are other cryptocurrencies like Ripple, for instance, that, were, mm -hmm. that started off on day one saying, hey, we want to be like, we want to have the ease of use of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, but actually we're gonna build in compliance right from the beginning. So it hasn't taken off as quickly, um, you would wonder why Bitcoin has taken off so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, some suggestions are that there's a lot of, uh, you know, illicit money floating around in Bitcoin, and mm -hmm. hence the likes of Ripple and so on hasn't taken off as much because it's not illicit money; it's actually compliant money. Um, so what we're seeing is a huge amount of changes that are going on. Um, but for what, what excites me is that regulators are coming in and they're actually promoting improvement. They're actually saying, not only are we asking you from a regulatory point of view, mm -hmm. society demands that we do a proper job of money uh, counter money, uh, anti money laundering, society demands that we do a good job on counter terrorist financing. But by the way, the outcome of this will be you will also be able to conduct your business faster, smarter, cheaper. And they're also sandboxing some of this, so giving opportunities for innovation and yep. to have dialogues in a way that I think we didn't see before. Um, here in the Netherlands, but also in, in London as well. So I, I appreciate you guys joining for this talk on compliance. I, I think we could stay here all night Including and continue you. to speak about this. And thank you for taking the time. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks. Thank you.